visuals can be deceiving. That's the original tagline for this movie when it was released in India back in late 2013. And it's certainly a movie that lives up to its tagline. Drisham, the original, has been remade six times. Four of those are just Indian dialect remakes from 2014 to 2017. But the movie we are comparing it to is its second international remake, the 2019 Chinese version called Sheep Without a Shepherd. If you're wondering, there's a 2017 Sri Lankan version as well. This is the first remake that's actually taken the original film and cut it down to a more concise 110 minutes. The original and all its remakes are over the 165 minute mark. You might think, with the whole 55 minutes removed, that the Chinese version might suffer, but it doesn't. And in this video, we're going to compare the original with the Chinese remake and see which one does the story better. Two words of warning before we commence. This video will contain spoilers for both versions of the film. It's almost impossible to create this comparison video without talking about spoilers. This is the first Indian movie I've ever seen. This means that I'm not aware of the history and nuance of Indian cinema. I'm not aware of how they create stories or portray drama and content on film. I am looking at this movie as a viewer of Asian cinema when doing this comparison. Hi. I'm the Artie Dance from Asian Film Fans and welcome to this comparison video of Drishyam and Sheep Without a Shepherd. Let's get into it. Both films share the exact same story outline. A small business owner in a village devises a plan to protect his family from prosecution by the police after his wife and daughter accidentally kill the son of the district police chief. In Drisham, we follow George Cuddy, played by veteran Indian actor Mohan Lal. He lives in a village with his wife and two daughters and runs a small business that provides cable TV broadcasts to subscribers. Alongside him is Monichan, his debt collector and advertising guru. George frequents a little cafe that's located opposite to the site of a new police station, which is about to commence construction. The local constable, Sadiva, also frequents the same cafe and uses his position as a policeman to get away with paying for the food and drink. The constable and George have a frosty relationship. They don't like each other. No other police officer in the town has any issues with George, however. George makes friends with the engineer who is responsible for building the new police station a point that is important later in the movie. George's wife wants to buy a new car and do a bit of shopping. George tags along with them and then they spend the evening at his wife, Rani's, parents' house where we find out that George is an orphan and considers his wife's family to be his own. It's also here where we learn about George's strict fiscal management when he reluctantly allows his daughter, Anju, to attend a nature camp for school but wants to know everything that happened. Rani suggests to George that they attend a religious family retreat called Divine, but George isn't keen. They return back to their village, and while his daughters Anju, the older one, and Anu, the younger one, are returning home from a visit to the grocery store, the son of the district police chief, Varun, approaches Anju. He wants to arrange a sexual tryst with her, and when she refuses, he shows her a video he filmed at the camp of her in the shower. That night, Varun meets Anju in the shed on the family property. But her mother Rani is also there. They beg him not to release the video and destroy their family. But he refuses unless Rani sleeps with him. In a fit of anger, Anju strikes Varun, accidentally killing him. When George returns home, he quickly devises a plan to hide and destroy all evidence that points to his family. Using all the knowledge he learned from watching movies all day long at work, he ditches Varun's car in a reservoir he buries his body and creates watertight alibis for his family. They quickly go on a family trip, attending the divine religious retreat and other locations such as a cinema, restaurant and take a bus ride to ensure there are plenty of witnesses to corroborate their alibi. Police Chief Geetha Prabhaka begins to investigate her son's disappearance when it leads them to George's village and to George and his family. Constable Sadivan the man with a grudge against George claims to have seen George driving Varun's car and with this evidence they begin exerting pressure on the family in the form of a series of violent interrogations on all members, including the youngest daughter Anu. 
While the whole family sticks to the story and their alibi, and all the witnesses validate George's story, Gita has a feeling they are lying and keeps up the pressure. When Anu finally breaks and tells the police where the body is buried, a mob forms at George's property as the police dig up the grave, with live TV broadcasts interviewing George's family and friends and the trouble the police are putting them through. But there is no body in the grave, and George and his family are acquitted by the force. Gita is then forced to resign from her role alongside Sadevan. In a breathtaking final scene, Gita and her businessman husband beg George to tell them what happened to their son. He retells them a hypothetical story, closing the case in their minds. The film then ends with George in the new police station, with the new police chief telling George he won't stop going after him until he knows the truth about what happened. The camera pans out to a wide shot of the new police station, letting the audience know exactly where the body is buried. Sheep Without a Shepherd has an almost identical storyline, with a few important differences due to complying with Chinese film censorship. We follow Li, who runs a small business providing internet services in a Chinese language community in Thailand. He also has a debt collector who works with him collecting the money owed while he stays in his office watching movies on VHS and DVD all day long. Li frequents a local cafe, a location where the local constable also visits. He is a vile, violent thug by the name of Sang Kung who uses his position to squeeze bribes out of the villagers. He doesn't like Li because he believes Li is always finding out a way to expose his behaviour. Lee loves his family, but has a strained relationship with his older daughter Ping Ping. When she wants to go on a school camp, he refuses due to the cost, but reluctantly agrees after his wife Yu convinces him. La Wen, the local police chief, transfers to the village police department to solve a crime that the local detectives are having difficulties with. It's here that it's established she is a force to be reckoned with, and alongside her politician husband, she's part of a powerful family. On the school camp, Ping Ping runs into Su Cha, the son of La Wen. He spikes her drink and then rapes her, filming it on his phone. Ping Ping wakes up the next morning and feels blood between her legs. Realizing what's happened, she begins to hide into her shell, blocking out her family. Lee's forced on an overnight business trip to fix a hotel's internet network. And while he's away, Su Cha approaches Ping Ping and shows her the video. He demands she has sex with him again and arranges to meet her at 10pm in her family shed. Scared, she eventually tells her mother and they devise a plan to confront him in the shed. But things go wrong and Ping Ping strikes Sucha across the head, killing him. In a fit of panic, they try to hide the body. Lee attempts to call his family to check up on them and when they don't answer the phone he gets worried and rushes home where he finds his wife and his daughter distraught. Lee assures them that nothing will happen as he works out a way to hide the body and all the evidence. He trains the family in what their story will be and immediately takes them on a trip to create an alibi. He checks out of the hotel he was staying in. He takes his family out to lunch, shopping, the cinema and a boxing match before they return home via the bus, ensuring there are many witnesses that will eventually corroborate his story. When Su Cha's car is found in a reservoir and his phone is tracked, the police begin their investigation on Lee's family, with Sang Kun adamant he witnessed Lee driving Su Cha's yellow sports car. As La Wen gets more and more desperate to find her son, the tactics of the police force turn more and more violent against Lee, but unable to find enough evidence, La Wen turns to interrogating the youngest daughter, An An herself. The child relinquishes the location of the grave where Su Cha is buried. The police attend, but a mob forms, angry at the treatment of Lee and his family by the police force. When the grave is dug up, they discover a sheep who was shot dead by Sang Kun days earlier in front of many of the townsfolk. They turn violent and start a riot, demanding Lee and his family are set free from persecution. The negative press results in La Wen's husband losing his candidacy as the next mayor. She resigns. Her life has fallen apart. The village has turned against her and the police force. Then we see at the end when La Wen and her husband meet Lee under a giant Buddha statue where Lee admits to the crime and where he has buried Sucha's body. He is then convicted of the murder and sentenced to prison. 
which is where the audience meets him at the beginning of the film. It is here, using his knowledge of the movie The Green Mile, he attempts to break out to freedom. These are two clever movies, with the only major difference being their endings. Otherwise, the differences are minor, yet still important enough to comment on. First to address the question of is it worth watching, and specifically which one is worth watching. And for that, there are two answers. Yes, they are both worth watching. They are both fantastic films in their own way, but if you had to choose one and time and story are important to you, then the obvious answer is to go with the Chinese remake. That's not to say that it's without its problems, which we will discuss later. The whole point of the movie is this. Can you edit the memories of people you meet into something believable? Can you convince a person that you met them on a particular date or that you did a particular thing? And that's exactly what both Lee and George explore with success in this film. There are moments where each movie shines differently to the other. With the Indian original, it's definitely the ending. It's brilliant and it's perfect. And it's exactly the outcome that you want. A middle-class business owner, bullied by the local police, his family put through hell, gets his revenge on a corrupt system. But the way the original tells the story is in a very muddled and bloated way. The first 45 minutes of the film are wasted on nothing other than repeatedly establishing the fact that George is frugal. This was done with three short pieces of dialogue in the Chinese version, and it's all done in the same scene. The original stretches this out beyond an acceptable level for the audience. It's also at the almost 60 minute mark of the movie when we finally get to the motive, whereas it's the 20 minute mark in the Chinese version. And there are a lot more examples where the Chinese version seems to balance the storytelling far better. Sang Kun is a far more menacing character than Sadevan. He is shown to be violent, corrupt, and a loose cannon, ready and willing to crush anyone who gets in his way. And while he is ultimately vindicated in the end, it's his attitude that almost costs the police their opportunity to capture Lee. Sadevan is shown more to be incompetent than anything else. There's always a low-key piece of comical music played when he's on scene, his facial expressions are over-exaggerated, and he never seems to be shown exhorting too much pressure on the locals other than the one scene where he sees George in the yellow car. In general, he just isn't a character you feel you should care too much about. And the fact that you don't see him until the 15 minute mark, whereas San Kung is shown within the first five minutes, doesn't really give the audience the impression he is a character we should pay too much attention to. However, when he is given the opportunity to showcase his violent side, it again becomes almost too comical to be believable. He beats George, his wife and daughter with no discrimination as to what he's doing. He is beating a confession out of them that he just won't get. And the ridiculous sound effects played over the top don't help in establishing him as that scary character either. It's not until a heartbreaking scene where he assaults Anu, the youngest daughter, that his monster character ever becomes a serious threat. And by then, he's gone from cartoon villain to Marvel movie villain in the blink of an eye. Juxtapose that with the Chinese version where it's La Wen who interrogates An An and does it without physical violence. As such is the power of her character. Check out the differences in the two scenes and specifically the menacing shot of Joan Chen at the end. <laughs> Gita, let's stop this. Let's stop this. Let's stop this. Let's stop this. Then we'll talk to him. Let's talk to him. Let's talk to him. Let's talk to him. Let's talk to him. Why are they here? 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 Gita, we're going to get a lot of pain. Let's get a lot of pain. Let's get a lot of pain.
你说，肯定听他们的声音。有你能够救爸爸妈妈，你告诉我，每天晚上你到底看到什么Speaking of La Wen, this is again another character that is far more developed in the Chinese version. When we are first introduced to her, it's within the movie's first seven minutes. She is interrogating a character to solve a crime no one else can. To the audience, we have quickly shown who our main villain in this movie is and why we should fear her. She's ruthless and she's efficient, and she gets the results she needs. Now let's take a look at how we're introduced to Geetha. It's one hour and fourteen minutes into the film until we see her, and even then, it's her husband who's doing anything in the scene. The camera frames her as timid. Don't forget, she is a highly decorated chief of police, and yet she is spoken down to by her businessman husband, who constantly interjects himself into scenes where she is working. In fact, it seems like he is there in almost every scene she is in, constantly telling her how to do her job. How is the audience supposed to believe she is a character anyone should fear when her husband is pulling all the strings? Let's also consider this: in the Chinese version, we meet La Wen before we meet Su Cha. That clearly goes to show you the importance of her character. We even meet her before we meet Li's family. Yet in Drisham, not only do we meet George's wife, daughters, father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law. Business partners and a bunch of random strangers before we even meet Geetha. We also meet Varun, her son and the victim, before we meet her. Where does that put Geetha in the pecking order of villains in this movie? Right at the back. So, as the audience, why should we worry about her character and be frightened of her power when the filmmaker has shown us that she doesn't really have any? This was addressed in the Chinese version by having her husband, played by Hong Kong actor Philip Kyung, as an absent father politician who cares more about his political career than the disappearance of his son. He doesn't interfere with La Wen's investigation, which in turn makes her feel he doesn't care. There is a fantastic scene in La Wen's office where she daydreams Su Cha is still alive. This allows the audience to connect with her as a mother figure, not just a police officer. No such scene ever occurs in Drisham, with the only care Geetha ever expresses towards Varun being her defending his credit card expenditure to her husband, and a shot of her looking at his photo. And in another telling fact that doesn't help the film is that we never see Varun and his parents together in a shot. The audience is never shown the fact they are a family; it's only really implied. Why should Geetha and her husband care about Varun when we never see them together? Why should the audience care? The Chinese version fixes this with a scene of a party where all three characters are shown briefly together. It's established to the audience that the son is a brat, the mother is overprotective, and the father has no idea how to control him. In one short scene, we know more about the family dynamic in the Chinese version than in the whole final half of the Indian original. We should also look at the incident which causes this whole tragedy to occur. Not the death of the police chief's son. They're both the same, but the incident at the camp that precedes it. In Drisham, Anju is the unsuspecting victim of a nude recording when Varun follows her into the showers and records the whole process. He then uses this to blackmail Anju into a sexual tryst, where the first time she learns about it being when he confronts her. It's at this point where her behaviour changes from being a happy girl to being a bit withdrawn. Now it's important to note that this withdrawn element only lasts until she accidentally kills Varun. After that point, she seems to return to normal. I'm going to chalk this one up to poor directing. Let's check out the same incident in Sheep Without a Shepherd. At the camp, we are introduced to Sucha, who is being a pest by taking photos of all the girls. 
the same as Drishal. However, Sucha takes a liking to Ping Ping and encourages her to drink some alcohol he has spiked with a date rape drug. When she passes out, he rapes her and records the whole thing, sharing the video with his close friend. She wakes up the next day and immediately knows something is wrong. She sees the blood down her thighs and is able to conclude that Sucha is the perpetrator. But she knows he is the son of the police chief and that makes her a vulnerable character. And because of this, she retreats into her shell and her change of behavior is immediate for the family. They notice how reserved she is and how she refuses to talk to or even touch her father. Now, when she next meets Sucha, she has a reason to be fearful of him. And when he shows her the video, she now has a motive, an even stronger reason to hate him. After he is killed, she acts the way you would expect. She is nervous and she is frightened. Observe her behavior on the family outing. She is quiet alongside her mother. They are the two that have the most to fear and they show it. We just don't get that in Drisha. Without a doubt, Drisham has the perfect ending. When you've spent 160 minutes cheering on George and his family, the last thing you want is for all of that to go to waste. Drisham also handles the alibi creation scenes with much more detail and care, and in fact explains to the audience in far more detail how George was able to recreate the memories in the witnesses' minds by revisiting them a second time to really solidify his story. It's clever, but perhaps a little overdone and would explain why this element was removed in the Chinese version. The scene of the grave being dug out is also a highlight of the film, where the body of a pig is exposed as the buried carcass. However, I think the Chinese version does this scene better. It's dark and it's rainy. The mood is well set by the director. It feels like it's the end for our family. The way Sang Kung smirks, then the look on his face when it is revealed it's a sheep. The sheep he shot in anger over Lee. The slow motion shots of the rain and the expressions on the family's faces, both Lee and La Wen, it's fantastic. Additionally, the way that Lee hides all the evidence seems far better recreated than what George does. Details such as wearing gloves to ensure he doesn't leave fingerprints behind on the car are overlooked in Trisham. And when George openly buys a mobile phone and then turns it on with Farron's SIM card in front of the merchant makes no sense. If he's trying to hide the evidence, why does he leave so much of his own behind? The main negative with Drisham is the running length. At over 2 hours and 45 minutes, it's just far too long for the story contained within. And certainly between 50 and 60 minutes could have been edited out and it would have improved the overall pacing of the movie. This is by far the biggest issue with the film, along with the rather unemotional acting by most of the cast. Now I feel it's important to mention that I know very little about Indian films and Indian culture. But personally, I found the way that George talks to and treats his wife to be rather demeaning and unnecessary, implying women should be in the kitchen only, that they should like going shopping and spending money and are rather powerless against males are frequently touched upon in this movie. And it then culminates in a scenes of violence against women, which will make an international audience feel uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean the Chinese version is without its issues and its biggest is government censorship. Because the Chinese police force can't be shown as being corrupt or acting aggressive against citizens, the movie is set in Thailand, where La Wen and Sang Kung are members of the Thai police force. This means they can do whatever they want, as they aren't representing the values of the Chinese police. Yet the biggest issue censorship had over this movie, and what almost completely ruined it, is what happened with the ending. Regulations state that a person who commits a crime must be punished. And thus, this is why at the end, Lee ends up in prison, contrary to what the original story tells. Issues with both movies center around the fact that both fathers are able to make this elaborate alibi just by watching movies. It's all too smooth and too effective and a plan that's pulled off too easily. There's a short montage in Drisham where we see George watch a series of movies so we can understand he's a movie fan but we don't quite understand how this relates to him creating the ultimate alibi. 
Same with Lee. We're shown this long list of movies he watched and the focus on the Korean thriller montage, but there's no real way to link any of that to the alibi created. In fact, the only way we really see both characters use their movie knowledge is at the start of each film, where they explain to respective customers in the cafes how they can use the law to their advantage and not pay a bribe to the corrupt constable, which also doubles as a way to show the audience why the constable doesn't like our main character. There will be a lot of people who like Grisham and who will prefer it over the Chinese remake, and that's fine. We're all entitled to separate opinions on what movie we prefer. I can acknowledge, and I hope that you do too, that both movies are brilliant and flawed in their individual ways. Whichever you choose is a matter of your own opinion and you won't be too disappointed. The Chinese version definitely tells the story a lot better. The Indian version most definitely has the better ending, the perfect ending in fact. And until we get a version that mixes both of these elements together, then I'm afraid this one is a tie. If you've seen it, what did you think? Thank you for watching this video. Please don't forget to press the like button and consider subscribing to support our channel.